Welcome to the France 24 interview. I'm Stephen Carroll. My guest today was once known as the Internet's chief lizard wrangler. She's the co-founder of Mozilla, which developed the open source browser Firefox and is now one of the loudest voices arguing for an Opal open and accessible internet. Mitchell Baker, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. At France 24, you're in Paris to talk about the social good that we need in technology. Is this something that should come from big technology companies or is it something that as internet users we should all be involved in? Well, the internet is so key to life. I think, you know, we should all actually be involved in what is it like and what does it mean? You know, for citizens it's hard because the technology is complex and opaque, but the core sense of is our society aimed solely at the economic rewards for shareholders of big companies, or is there more to the world we want? Uh, and at Mozilla, we've always taken the stance, there's more to the world that we want. That's why our tech organization trying to build products, and in our sort of guiding document, the Mozilla Manifesto, we even have a principle about blending economic good uh, and private economic incentive, which is such a powerhouse, but with social good and with the parts of humanity that aren't about generating revenue. And like do, you think that's a, do, you, yeah. do you think that's a message that resonates among those dominant players online? Because we, as you say, so much of this is invested now in private companies. Well, I think f in the tech space for a long time, there's been a view that what's good for tech is good for the world. And that because it's innovative and it's cool and there's new things happening, I mean, who could have imagined the internet 30 years ago? That that's not so unreasonable to think if we move forward and invent cool new things, it'll all be great. Uh, you know, Mozilla has been a voice for something different for a long time, but I think because we're a nonprofit, it, it has felt cute or uh, something, but, but not realistic. And today it appears much more realistic. So I think today we're seeing all actors start to understand that technology has a deep impact on society. Like, not everyone wants to deal with it. There's one prominent VC in Silicon Valley who, you know, has bemoaned, you know, the, the interest in social justice and wants to just get back to making tech, uh, which I think that era may be behind us. And how much of that do you think played into what happened around the US election? The idea, you know, fake news being something that is now common parlance, it's something that people talk about regularly. We're all a little bit more aware of how influences on social media and online can influence things like elections. I think the elections, not just in the US, but increasingly everywhere, are playing a role. And I also think there's a fair amount of personal experience that's playing a role in questioning everything about tech is great. Certainly, if you are a woman uh, online or you are not in the dominant group in some certain sector, uh, the ability with which people can threaten and abuse and really uh, traumatize and change your life and make you afraid to go home, like that's, that opens eyes too. And so, uh, you know, the, the categories of people who live with hate speech and death and torture threats now is very high. And so I think that, that brings it home as well. And of course, the elections and the effect on democracy is another sort of one-two punch into the idea that, you know, technology can develop without effect or without integration uh, or, or without, you know, goals about society. Uh, and, I, and I do want to say, I do think that many of the founders in Silicon Valley have this view they're doing good uh, and uh, that, you know, doing good tech is doing good for the world. So it's a that, I to think, be a is a beginning of changing. That, really. Yes, exactly. Um, one of the issues in the United States uh, in recent times has been the issue of net neutrality. This is the idea that companies can pay for faster internet and with, it gives a two-speed or more speed internet uh, after the decision made by the Federal Communications Commission to roll back on, on net neutrality. Um, the Senate Democrats tweeted, a, I think, a very sort of clear message on this where they said that we'd be getting the internet one word at a time uh, if yeah. net neutrality was allowed to be repealed. The, Mozilla is challenging this decision. Why did you take that decision? We think net neutrality is a key aspect of the internet for a couple different reasons. One, in many places, human beings have little or no choice of who their network provider is. And that's true in developing markets, and it's true in developed markets as well. It's true of a large percentage of American citizens, for example. And so if you have no competition, 
and the one provider can do whatever it wants for its business, like that is the definition of a monopoly with ultimate power and a consumer or a citizen who is helpless. And that's a bad place to be for a fundamental part of life. Do you think that'll be resolved by the courts? And, and will it be a court decision that changes this? Or will state actions, because we're seeing some yes. states now working on that too? Yes. Well, I think we don't know, you know, what will be the most effective tool and it's very interesting, the state actions, that many of them, that is the sort of the grassroots, uh, in the American political system, the states are the grassroots response to problems. So we do see large grassroots organizations. Um, the, the public engagement in India was another unexpected grassroots organization about, about net neutrality. So I think all tools will be in play from, from various actors. And if I could, I'd say the other reason we care so much about net neutrality is you need a neutral platform to have innovation. And so if we want more than one or two providers of anything in the world, we have to enable competition and net neutrality or the loss of net neutrality makes it much harder because if you're the one big player, you can, you have relations with the network operators, you can pay them. Uh, but if you're a new startup with a new idea, that's a very high barrier to entry. And so the loss of net neutrality is really the loss of innovative potential. Another issue that you've been involved in is in India, and this is a controversy over uh, Aadhaar, which is the Indian government's uh, identity, really digital identity yes. for its citizens. You wrote an open letter, which was published in the Indian media, uh, calling on the, the committee that's looking at this uh, to rethink their data protection network. Why did you get involved in this issue? A couple of reasons. One, Mozilla has an active community in India, so many of our volunteers are in India. You know, Mozilla is an open source nonprofit, public benefit organization, and so volunteers are important to us. Uh, and they have made us deeply aware of the grassroots activity. And secondly, the issues are also key. Adhar is a global identity system. Uh, and so what we found is there, there tend to be two camps here. One is the camp that says people need digital identity, yes, and the other is the camp that says people need actual privacy and security. And, and both of those are true. So we're engaging to try and see if we can help bridge those two things, because giving a digital identity to, to citizens, that's a good thing. But Adhar, for example, claims to be voluntary, but in practice it's really not. Like you have a choice, you can, I mean, we all have a choice, right? We could not eat and die, or you could not have an identity and, you know, And the argument not with get this benefits. Is, is to access certain services, yes. you need to have one of these numbers. Right. Almost every service. And so the idea of the system has merit, um, but you have a large centralized system under which individuals have almost no control, and you don't have much control over what happens to your data, and it's not really clear that it's secure. And so we have involved ourselves or engaged to try and encourage good data protection. I'll just give one example. The uh, original proposal said that your biometric information is not personal data. But really, what is more personal to you than your fingerprint or your retina scan? Like, there's nothing. There's no password or address or a credit card number that's more personal to you than your iris scan. And once it's hacked and somebody else owns it, like, you can't get a new iris. You can't just go reset your fingerprints. And so these things have to be personal information. And so we're hopeful that if a good law about the treatment of personal data is enacted, then things like digital identity systems will be much more sustainable in the long run. Have you had any response from the Indian authorities? No, no, not yet. Not yet. Uh, another issue that I'd like to talk to you about is I know that you've been involved in efforts to try and get more women involved in the technology world. It's, it's something that is being discussed across many, many sectors now. What can be done, do you think, to encourage more women to get to positions like yours? Well, there's one, encouraging, uh, and that starts very young. And there's two, actually meaning it. So actually meaning it means change from a range of people. So research is beginning to show that uh, groups tend to evaluate people like them higher than others. And so that applies across race, it applies across gender. And so these are research studies where you'll present, say, the same CV with mm -hmm. different names, vastly different results. Or you have a slideshow and the 
text is read by a man or read by a woman. Vastly different results. And so we have to overcome that. Uh, we have to take abuse more seriously uh, because the number of women who leave or struggle because of abuse. Uh, I mean, is technology going to have or is it having a Me Too moment as well that we're seeing in other industries? Well, I think part of the Me Too movement, at least in the United States, came out of the tech industry, mm. uh, you know, from the, the engineer at Uber. So I, I think partially. Uh, uh, so, but, but first there's encouragement, two, we all have to change, three, we tend to evaluate women much more harshly, and that requires a very conscious effort to change. Four, it turns out having one woman is often not a solution because she's the only one of her kind, and all sorts of difficult dynamics develop. So to really make change, I, I think the research is suggesting something like 25 or 30 percent of a group needs to be different. And so just hiring one or two people, it seems like it might be enough. It should change everything, but it doesn't. And um, so those are some starting points. Just as a brief conclusion, you have a, a long and uh, illustrious history and, and career in the, the technology industry. What, what's your next big challenge, do you think, that we're facing in, in technology? What's going to be the next big issue for the industry? Uh, well, it's hard to say one. Uh, I'll go back and say, I think this question of does technology relate to society? Like within the industry or is that separate is very key. If it's separate, it will all be regulation. Uh, and I think that there'll be a ton of unintended consequences. That's one. And then secondly, technology, especially with voice and machine learning, will impact everything. And so figuring out how we relate to technology when it's everywhere all the time is a pretty big challenge, too. OK, Mitchell Baker of Mozilla, thank you very much for coming in to speak to us thank at you. France 24. Thank you to you for watching. Do stay tuned. There's more news coming up. Fifty-one percent, presented by Annette Young. A program about women who are reshaping our world. We meet those who seek equality, be it in the boardroom or at the village well. The fifty-one percent brings you stories from across the globe about the women who are challenging the way we think. The fifty-one percent on France 24 and France24.com.